Warp has been a staple of Fire Emblem since Chapter 3 of Fire Emblem 1, where Lina joins her army with the first ever Warp staff. Since then, Warp has appeared in most Fire Emblem games in some form or another, but how it's worked has changed pretty heavily from game to game. Let's look at how Warp has changed and how each iteration of Warp has had a different effect on the design of the game that it's in. And then I'll talk about what I think Warp is good for and when I don't like it. To start with, we have Fire Emblem 1 and Shadow Dragon where Warp has infinite range. And this is also the case in Fire Emblem 3 and Fire Emblem 12. In these games, Warp is an incredibly powerful tool for skipping maps, and it's limited only by when you get the staff and how many uses it has. Part of why Warp is so powerful in these games is because you just get so many uses. In Shadow Dragon, Warp staffs have 7 uses each, and we get up to 3 throughout the course of the game. That's at least 21 Warps, and we get our first one really early. But there's even more because we also get a Hamurn staff in Chapter 20 that can be used to restore the uses of any Warp staff. So basically, you get up to 18 warps before chapter 20 and nearly unlimited warps afterwards. But what are we going to do with all those warps? This is a perfect pair of games to look at to begin with because they show just how powerful warp can be, particularly when it's available in abundance. Shadow Dragon is a game where every map's objective is seize, meaning all we have to do to win the map is kill one enemy and get Marth to the throne. This means that with a couple warps, many maps in Shadow Dragon can be totally skipped. Take a look at Chapter 24. This map is loaded with scary enemies, and playing the map normally you'll have to fight quite a few of them. But with the power of warp, we can easily bypass all the enemies and complete the map. You can even grab side objectives. The map has a pretty important chest, for example, and you can warp someone right to it while still having enough warp users and staff users to kill the boss and seize the throne. This method works even better in Fire Emblem 1, because in Fire Emblem 1, Marth is a pretty strong unit, so you can often just warp him, have him kill the boss, and then seize on the following turn. This is unlike Shadow Dragon, where Marth is a lot weaker on harder difficulties, and you'll usually have to warp a boss killer and then use a second warp use to warp Marth to the throne. So what effect does this have on the game? I would say a big positive of warp in these games is that it lets you skip maps you don't like. Every Fire Emblem game has a couple clunky maps that you might not want to play, and warping in Shadow Dragon means that you don't have to play those maps if they're not going to be fun for you. The downside is that warp can make the game a little brainless at a certain point. In my first Hard 5 run, I got to a point where I realized the game was essentially over. My units were good enough to kill the remaining bosses, and I had enough warp uses for each remaining map. I don't remember exactly when I realized this, but it was at least 8 or 9 maps before the end of the game. Of course, you can always choose not to use warp, but I always feel a little dumb struggling through a map the normal way when I could use my win the game staff instead. I generally would like each game to provide a good gameplay experience without me having to arbitrarily limit myself. Plus, as we're going to get into, warp can be a fun tool to use and a more balanced one as well, so I like it when it is that way. I want to be able to use warp and have fun. But in Shadow Dragon, there's just so many uses of warp that just end a map without you really having to think about it much, which to me is not ideal for a strategy game. FE3 and 12 work similarly to one in Shadow Dragon, but it's worth noting that FE12's hardest difficulty removes warp, so no warp skipping the problem maps in that one. In between Fire Emblems 1 and 3, we had Fire Emblem Gaiden, and then later Echoes remaking that, which made a couple important adjustments to warp. The first is that it's no longer a consumable staff, but rather a spell that units like Silk can learn. In Gaiden, Warp functions similarly to how it did in 1, but in Echoes, Warp isn't infinite range anymore. In both games, there's no set time where you get access to Warp, instead you level up Silk until she unlocks it. So what chapter Warp is available to you for will vary each playthrough. Additionally, Echoes has two armies, and Silk can only be in one at a time, so barring Revival Shrine Warping, you're going to have to play a significant amount of chapters without warp in both Gaiden and Echoes. That's already a big change from FE1, but the change that really affects how warp plays in Gaiden and Echoes is the map objectives. Almost every map in Gaiden and Echoes is kill all enemies, and this means that unlike Shadow Dragon, we can't do something like warp to the boss and seize the throne. Despite this, warp is still really useful. You can warp someone over to deal with faraway enemies or over difficult terrain. Basically, you'll always find a use for warp, it just doesn't instantly end the map like it does in Shadow Dragon. I really like how warp works in these games because it feels a little more strategic. In Shadow Dragon, you don't need to think too hard about how to warp, you just warp your boss killer to the boss and you warp Marth to the throne. 
In Gaiden, you have to think about where you're going to warp a unit to, where they're going to help you with the map the most. There's no very obvious warp target square, and I think that's a really good thing. Gaiden and Echoes are games that get a lot of flack, and maybe some of that is deserved, but I love the way warp works in these games. It's a lot of fun thinking about how you're going to use it, and leveling Silk to get to it is a neat side objective in the early game maps. In these games, warp is something that makes gameplay more interesting rather than allowing you to skip maps very quickly. The next game to make a major change to the way warp works is FE4. And FE4 maps are massive, so it makes sense that they didn't want to do something like infinite range warp. Instead, warp lets you send units to any allied castle. This makes the staff way more limited in its usage compared to previous games, but it's still pretty decent. There's a couple maps where being able to move someone to a castle can help you get to the next objective faster. Or if there are enemies targeting a castle you forgot to defend, you can always warp someone over to help it out. Perhaps most importantly though, warp gives quite a bit of experience and is easily spammable. This allows you to get a lot of experience onto any unit that can use warp, and this is often used to get someone like Lachesis a bunch of experience so that she can get to her awesome promotion without having to suffer through her footlocked combat. This is a version of Warp that makes sense for FE4's giant multi-part maps, but it's definitely the least exciting version of Warp in the series. The follow-up to FE4, Thracia776, went back to infinite range Warp in all of its glory, but it does a few things that make infinite range Warp work better than it did in FE1 and 3. First, Warp only has three uses, and the game only hands you a couple instances of the staff. So you have to be a little more selective on where to use those warps. There are more warps in the game, because you can capture enemies with a warp staff and take it for yourself. So you can always get more warps, but it's nice that it feels like a reward for good play and planning since you have to go out of your way to get them. Additionally, a lot of maps in Thracia just can't be warp skipped because of the objective. It's difficult to warp skip an escape map without leaving some dudes behind or using multiple warps, and there are also a couple defense maps that can't be warped. You can use Warp to skip some of the more difficult seas maps though, so Warp in Thracia often plays out like a resource management game, where you have to decide what maps and side objectives you can get without Warp so that you can save Warps for other, more difficult objectives later. A good example of this is the Dragon Spear Village in Chapter 14. You can absolutely get this village without warping, but it's pretty tricky as Dean will have to fly past tons of enemies and ballistas. You can warp him but that will be one warp that you don't have for later maps, so players will have to make a decision on whether they want to take the risk to send him out and go get the village, if they're willing to take on that challenge, or if they're willing to burn a warp and not have access to it for later maps. Thracia also introduced the rewarp staff, which allows the staff user to warp themselves. And this is pretty easy to get a bunch of, but it takes quite a while to get any really good combat units to a high enough staff rank to use it. So it's often used to send a staffer to go deal with some non-combat objective or to get to an escape point. Especially on your first playthrough, Thracia really makes you want to be judicious with your warps and pick and choose the maps that you want to skip. Warp is super powerful here, and it is often just a win the map button, but there's also a fun resource management component because not every map can be warp skipped. On subsequent playthroughs, the system does lose a bit of luster since you'll have a pretty good idea how many warps are available to you and what the most difficult maps are, but even with experience, two different Thracia players might use their warps pretty differently, especially in the mid-game. And I think that makes it a more interesting part of the game than warp is in something like Shadow Dragon, even if the functionality is ultimately pretty similar. After Fire Emblem 5, warp got a nerf from its infinite range in FE 6, 7, and 8. Warp works pretty similarly in all three of these, the main difference being how warp range is calculated. In Fire Emblem 6, warp range is half the staff user's magic plus 5, and in 7 and 8, it's just half the staff user's magic. Right off the bat, this is a change that I like. No infinite range warp means you often can't skip from the beginning of a map right to the end, and warp range being based on magic means there's some incentive to train up your warp user, and this also differentiates the units that can use warp a bit more. In infinite range warp games, once you hit warp rank, you are equally good at warping as everyone else. I like that units with more magic stand out a bit more in 6, 7, and 8 due to having their higher warp range. Another change these games made is that warp comes relatively later than it did in previous games. It comes the earliest in 6, about two-thirds through the game, while in 7 it arrives four chapters before the end of the game not counting Guidance, and in Sacred Stones you get it six chapters before the end of the game. Warp arriving later has some upsides and downsides. The upside is that it means previous maps didn't have to be designed around warp, 
the developers didn't have to worry about a warp skip in chapters 6 or 7 if there's no warp available to the player then. The downside is that this means there's no real resource management around warp. The staff has 5 uses, so even without considering Hamern, that's enough to warp every remaining map in 7 and almost every remaining map in 8. So unless you're restricting yourself from warping, there's no real thought about where to use warp in something like FE8, especially when you consider that you can use Hamern to give yourself even more warp uses. One thing I like about the way warp plays out in Fire Emblem 8 is that the game makes you really consider your weapon ranks. In all previous games, you're handed at least one unit that can just use warp at base, such as Lena in Shadow Dragon or Pent in Fire Emblem 7. But in Sacred Stones, you never get a unit that just joins your army with A-rank staves. So you have to make sure that you raise a unit staff rank in order to have them ready for warp on time. This isn't a hard thing to do, Mulder practically does it by accident, but it does add some interesting wrinkles to a few units. Since warp range is determined by the magic stat, you might want someone like Saleh to be your warper so that you can do a big warp skip on the final map. He only comes with C staves though, so you have to consider his staff rank and work on it, and he may even need a stat booster or two to get his magic high enough for his warp range to be big enough to cross the gap on the final map of Sacred Stones. Basically, there's a bit of a long-term planning aspect to warp in FE8. You need to pick your warper a little early to make sure they get their rank up in time, and there's implications on which one you pick depending on how high their magic is. And I like that. After Fire Emblem 8, we have a break from warp for a while, as Tellius didn't have warp. It does have rescue, but that's a little different. We already talked about 11 and 12, and warp isn't in Awakening or Fates either, so the next game we get to talk about is Three Houses. And warp is real good in Three Houses. Like Gaiden and Echoes, Warp isn't a staff in this game, it's a spell that certain units, such as Lysithia, can learn. Though in this game they learn it by increasing their faith skill instead of by increasing their level. As a result, it's possible to get Warp pretty early in three houses by recruiting Lysithia and tutoring her faith up. And once you have it, you'll be able to use it in every map where you field the Warper. Similar to GBA Fire Emblem games, Warp in three houses has its range determined by magic stat, but instead of it being half your magic stat, it's a quarter of your magic stat. That's quite a bit lower, but stats can get pretty high in three houses, so those warp ranges can become quite sizable, especially if you farm up some magic stat boosters in the garden. What really makes warp tick in three houses, though, is how it combines with other mobility tools like the stride gambit. Between all the movement tools three houses has to offer, like warp stride and the march ring, it's pretty easy to get a flyer an incredibly long distance in a single turn. What makes Warp even stronger in Three Houses is that there's so many kill boss maps. So being able to warp and stride so far often means you can get your boss killer over to the boss and end the map in just one or two turns. So Warp is really strong in Three Houses. I think Warp would probably have been a bit more reasonable if either stride didn't exist or if there were more maps with non-kill boss objectives, but as it stands, Warp is incredibly powerful in Three Houses. Our last game to look at Warp in is Engage, and it's a bit of a weird one. Warp is incredibly available here, you get multiple warps and rewarps throughout the game, and with the introduction of the Well, you can get even more of them if you're lucky. Warp range is up to 5 spaces in Engage, which is shorter than some previous games in the series, and another limiting factor for Warp and Engage is that bosses usually have multiple health bars, and sometimes there can even be multiple bosses. This matters because it means you can't just warp one unit to the boss and have them end the map. At most, they can get through one health bar. On the surface, this seems like a great way to balance warp, limited range so that you have to position and place some of the map before you can skip, and warping one unit to the boss often doesn't end the map. These are great limitations. However, Engage gives us a few ways around these limitations. One of them is Micaiah. The Makaya emblem makes staves hit multiple allies, allowing the player to warp or rewarp four units at once. You can combine this with refreshes like Seedal's Dance and Byleth's Goddess Dance in order to warp multiple times in a turn, and this lets you cover a lot of distance and have plenty of actions for fighting the boss once you arrive. Combining these tools can make a lot of maps skippable, even if they don't seem like they should be at a glance. Still, figuring out the warp skips in Engage is a lot more fun than in a lot of other games because there's so many moving parts. And you don't have access to Makaya for a lot of the game, so there's no multi-man warping shenanigans for most of the mid-game. I think if Makaya's warp utility were dialed back just a little bit, warp would be really cool in this game. It's just a little bit too much when she's around. So that's warp in all the game it appears in, and if I'm honest, I'm not a big fan of it most of the time. 
In casual playthroughs where you want to experience the game more completely, it's often just ignored or maybe used to trivialize a side objective. And if you're more experienced or trying to optimize a game, it's often used to make maps less interesting, or you set a restriction so that you don't use it at all. There are some exceptions where warp can be pretty fun, like figuring out optimal warps in maps like the Gorgon Egg Map in Fire Emblem 8, or in games like Gaiden where a warp doesn't necessarily end the map immediately. But in games like Shadow Dragon, warp often simplifies maps a little too much for my taste. I do think that warp as a skip map staff can have some benefits in a game like Thracia where there's at least a resource management component to using it, but in a lot of games that aspect simply isn't there. In Sacred Stones, for example, by the time you get warp, you have enough warp uses for the entire rest of the game. So there's no interesting decision with warp to be made beyond, do you want to play the kill boss and seize maps for the rest of the game, or do you want to skip them? To me, warp is at its best when the best square to warp a unit to isn't immediately obvious, and when that warp use doesn't immediately end the map. For that reason, Gaiden and Echoes have my favorite version of the spell. It's always interesting to use because you have to think about where to warp a unit where they're going to be the most helpful for routing the map. Plus, I like the little early game side objective of getting kills onto Silk so that she can warp sooner rather than later. I think Engage is also really close to having a really fun but not game-breaking warp. If Makaya didn't let you warp so many people, or if there were fewer turn refreshes in the game, warp would be a really neat tool but not necessarily an immediate solution to so many maps. Now, I did want to address two common counter-arguments I've heard when I talk about warp. One is that it's nice to be able to skip maps that you don't want to play, and I'm of two minds about this. One is that instead of having a skip map staff, I'd rather them just design the maps a little bit better. But two is that warp isn't even really good at this job. Outside of Shadow Dragon, not every map can be skipped, and you often don't have warp for most of the game. So it's more like warp allows you to skip a very small, specific group of maps in each game, versus allowing you to skip whatever maps frustrate you the most. If we really wanted warp to allow the player to just skip a few maps per playthrough, we would be better off with an actual skip map button instead, which would fulfill that design goal. Now, I don't necessarily want this, but if the good aspect of warp is that it lets us skip annoying maps, a skip button would do the same thing but better. The other argument is that you can just not use warp, and this one is true, but warp can be fun. It's fun in Gaiden and Thracia, and I like it when it's fun. And in general, I don't like it when I have to restrict the game or not use certain tools in order to find the fun. So yeah, sometimes I don't use warp, but I would like it if I didn't have to do that, or if warp were just fun more often. So those are my thoughts on warp. For me, warp is at its most fun when there's either a resource management component or when there's an interesting choice regarding where to warp your units, or when warping doesn't immediately end the map. Which game's version of warp is your favorite, though, and why? I'd love to hear what you think in the comments, or if you want to talk about Fire Emblem more, consider hopping in the community discord. You'll find the link in the video description. Lastly, if you liked the video and want to see more like it, consider hitting the like or subscribe button and have yourself a lovely week.